All right, this is basic theology number 10. The subject for tonight is the inspiration of scripture. This is Caversham Community Church and Firm Foundation New Zealand. I'm Jeff Coleman, and it is 6 March 2022. So tonight, uh, the inspiration of scripture. Next week, we'll um, continue the topic of the inspiration of scripture, looking at some uh, some defections in modern day theology from the doctrine of inspiration. And then in two weeks time, we'll teach on the inerrancy of scripture. This is what's ahead. So we're on the doctrine of bibliology, uh, the doctrine of scripture right now. So here's the agenda for tonight. Uh, we will define the inspiration of scripture. Um, I'll talk about the debate that, that has gone on about the inspiration of scripture over the last 200 years, the importance of the doctrine, um, five key, or no, I think it's four key passages, um, some characteristics of the inspiration of scripture, some data where the, uh, where the biblical authors um, get their information, We'll clarify some things about the doctrine of inspiration, talk about the necessary balance that we need to have with, the, with inspiration, some of the benefits of the in, inspiration of scripture, um, the fact that God gave us his word in written form, some of the benefits of that, and then some of the implications of the inspiration of scripture, the impact that scripture has had in history, We'll summarize everything and then give a few applications. So before we get into the definition, let me pray for us tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity again to study theology together as a church. Lord, we just want to have uh, correct thoughts, correct doctrine. Um, we want to have sound biblical uh, truth. Uh, in our hearts, in our souls, so that we may live wisely, and so that we may be equipped and complete um, as Christians. So, Lord, please teach us from your word, and thank you that it is inspired, and that we get to talk about that tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's get into a uh, definition of the inspiration of Scripture here. This is... Um, a quite well-known definition by Charles Ryrie. Again, Charles Ryrie wrote the basic theology book that we're using as um, our sort of uh, guide as we uh, go into all areas of theology this year as a church. And this is his definition of inspiration. God superintended the human authors of the Bible so that they composed and recorded without error his message to mankind in the words of their original writings. Charles Ryrie is a master of summing up a doctrine in a few well-chosen words. Um, he's, he's probably the best that I know at that. And so every word here is important. Um, now we should say that in everyday speech, uh, inspiration can mean a lot of things. Um, a dictionary definition of the English word to inspire can mean to influence, move, or guide by inspiration, or to exert an animating, enlivening, or exalting influence on. So, for example, we might use in everyday speech that uh, someone, so and so, was was inspired by a song they heard, and so we use we use the word inspired. Um, in that way. And it has nothing to do with God. It's just maybe we had an emotional feeling when we uh, listened to a song or it brought back a memory and it brought, brought, we were inspired by that song or by a poem or something to have a certain thought. Um, so we, we use the word inspired in that way. Someone might say, um, you know, seeing, uh, smelling that perfume uh, inspired me with nostalgia of a girlfriend I used to date, or um, when I visited a cathedral, um, I was inspired to write a song, you know, or I was really inspired by my 
by meeting X person to do Y. So this is kind of a common everyday way to use the word inspire, but that's really not how we're using it here. Because in Christianity, the word inspired or the concept of inspiration takes on a much more technical and specific meaning that's very, very important. And what we mean by inspiration is that is this is this definition right here that God superintended the human authors of the Bible so that they composed and recorded without error his message to mankind in the words of their original writings. So the word superintend allows for a spectrum of relationships that God had with the individual human authors. Um, so that's a key word there. The word composed shows that the writers were not passive stenographers. They weren't just dictating like a secretary what God said, but their, they act, their personality and their own thinking was involved as they were writing scripture. So they composed scripture. It's without error. Um, that's the doctrine of inerrancy, which we will talk about two weeks from now. And fourthly, that the inspiration doesn't extend beyond the original writings. And what we mean by original writings are the, the original uh, piece of animal skin or papyrus or, or stone that Moses wrote or that Samuel wrote or that Isaiah wrote. That original piece of paper, the first the first original from which every other copy came, that is what's inspired. When the, when the ink hit the piece of vellum or the piece of animal skin, that letter and that word and that sentence, that is what's inspired. So the copies uh, that were copied after that from that original aren't inspired. Um, now they can they, they are copies of an inspired text, so they're still very valuable, um, but, but it's the original, the original manuscript itself that's, that's um, inspired, that's God-breathed, so that's important. So another definition that's similar is this from one, my favorite professor from Dallas Seminary. He said, without impairing the intelligence, individuality, literary style, or personal feelings of the human authors, God supernaturally directed the writing of scriptures so it records with perfect accuracy his comprehensive and infallible revelation to man. Inspiration extends equally to all scripture. So notice the emphasis on um, God not impairing or doing away with the intelligence, individuality, or li literary style of the human authors. But nevertheless, the finished product um, is directed supernaturally by God so that those words and phrases and letters record with perfect accuracy God's perfect and truthful revelation to mankind. So that's what we're talking about. Now, there is a huge debate about inspiration. Take a look uh, at this quote from Charles Ryrie. Although those holding many theological viewpoints would be willing to say the Bible is inspired, one finds little uniformity as to what is meant by inspiration. Some focus it on the writers, others on the writing, still others on the readers. Some relate it to the general message of the Bible, others to the thought, still others to the words. Some include inerrancy, many don't. These differences call for precision in stating the big biblical doctrine. So there is lots of erroneous teaching around the doctrine of inspiration. Um, almost every church in Dunedin would hold to the inspiration of scripture, but the the devil's in the details. What do they mean by inspiration? What exactly is inspired? And so that is a key question that we must ask. It's a key question that you would ask, that you should ask when determining which church to attend. 
um, you want to uh, you'll want to attend and be part of and be a member of a church that holds to not just inspiration in a broad sense broad sense but verbal plenary inspiration and we'll talk more about what that means our church caversham community church holds to the unlimited verbal plenary inerrant inspiration of the bible and this this viewpoint this doctrine that we hold does set a set us apart from most uh, Christian churches and most evangelical churches in Dunedin. Um, and so, uh, so we need to know about this doctrine and we need to understand why we believe what we believe and its implications. So the importance of the inspiration of scripture really can't be overstated. Listen to this quote from the famous Princeton theologian Benjamin Warfield. How are we to account then for the singular constancy of its confession of the Bible's doctrine of inspiration? It is due to an instinctive feeling in the church that the trustworthiness of the scriptures lies at the foundation of trust in the Christian system of doctrine and is therefore fundamental to the Christian hope and life. It is due to the church's instinct that the validity of her teaching of doctrine as the truth of God rests on the trustworthiness of the Bible as a record of God's dealings and purposes with men. Practically, we must say that the condition of the persistence of Christianity as a religion for the people is the entire trustworthiness of the scriptures as the record of the supernatural revelation, which Christianity is. That's a great quote. A couple of things to point out here from Benjamin Warfield, there's an instinctive feeling, you see that, and an instinct that he refers to. There's, a, there's an instinctive feeling that if we give up the full plenary verbal inspiration of scripture, we're giving up the whole faith, because our faith is so, the doctrines that we believe are so tied up in and based in the very words of scripture, so that if you if you take away the foundation of scripture, you are left with nothing. We can't really know for sure that our doctrines are true. And so the inspiration of scripture and the belief in that is, is central to the, the super or is central to the, 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 the foundation of our faith. And you see this, I mean, this is just fact a fact of history is that when churches uh, begin to um, stray from the inspiration of scripture, the full inspiration of scripture, or when a seminary or Bible college strays from the full uh, inspiration of scripture down to the very word, it begins to become liberal. And over time, over decades, it loses its distinctive Christian beliefs. That happens every time. And it's even to conservative seminaries and, and Bible schools that were, were trustworthy 50 years ago probably aren't today because they have strayed from the full inspiration of scripture. So let's look at, um, let's see, one, two, three, four key passages from the Bible that really stress the fact of biblical inspiration, full biblical inspiration. So the first is Matthew 5. This is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. In verses 17 to 19, he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the Torah until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is, is stressing that he has come to fulfill the Torah 
and the prophets. That covers the entire Old Testament. So that's that's all two thirds of the Bible, maybe close to three fourths of the Bible. So he's saying all of this, the Torah and the prophets, will be fulfilled down to the very iota or dot. So not a single iota or dot will be taken away. In Hebrew, there is there's a letter called Yod, and you see on this um, on this slide, it's the letter on your right. Um, so Hebrew reads right to left. So see that first letter? That's a yod. It looks uh, like a squiggle, squiggle mark. That's what Jesus was talking about. He's saying not a jot, not a yod here. So, so imagine, you know, the whole Old Testament and every word, you know, words are ma made up of letters. And some of the letters are in Hebrew are quite small, like this yod. It's the smallest Hebrew letter. And Jesus is saying not a single, the single smallest letter in the Old Testament will pass away, but it will be fulfilled. So, so this is showing that Jesus had a high view of the Old Testament and that he believed that, that the inspiration or the importance of the Old Testament um, applied down to the very word, even, even letter. Every letter of the Old Testament is inspired, is scripture, and will be fulfilled. So that is really solid proof that Jesus believed in the full inspiration, the total inspiration of the Old Testament. So that is pretty, pretty cool there. Our next passage is 1 Corinthians 2, 6, 6 to 16. Of course, this is written by Paul. Now, this is an extended quote. Um, verse 10 and verse 13 are going to be where we focus on, but I want to read the whole quote because it gives the context. So starting in verse 6, yet among the mature, we, and we there refers to apostles, so that's Paul, Peter, and the others, do impart wisdom, although it is a wisdom not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God. Okay, so this is a wisdom not from man, but from God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would have not, not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So everything, this, this heavenly wisdom or this divine wisdom from God is beyond human reason. It's beyond human experience. So it's revealed, it's revelation from God. Now, notice what he says in verse 10. But to us, referring to apostles, God revealed these things through the Spirit. Okay, so that's the doctrine of special revelation, which Jacques taught us on last week. So this isn't the doctrine of inspiration. This is the doctrine of special revelation here in verse 10. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? so also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we, apostles, have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. So that's special revelation still. So in God, when God, um, God had thoughts in his mind, that he wanted to reveal to the prophets and apostles. And his revealing those thoughts is called special revelation, but still there's nothing written. There's no scripture at this point. But verse 13 is where we get the doctrine of inspiration, because now those apostles and prophets are going to now write it down, or in some cases speak it orally when they visited the churches, but eventually they wrote down their, this revelation in letters, 
and gospels. So say, see in verse 13, and we apostles impart this, so every the content that they've get, gotten from God in words, and these words are not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. And then, yeah, I've got the Greek there. And then explaining spiritual truths to the spiritual. That's the illumination of Scripture. So you've got lots of doctrines related to Scripture here all together. You've got special revelation, which is God revealing it to apostles. And then you have the inspiration of Scripture, which is the apostles relating it to, to believers in either oral form when they're visiting the churches or in written form when they're write, writing letters. And notice here, very, very important in verse 13, the apostles are imparting this truth in words, and those words are not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Now, you can imagine that what God could have done is he could have inspired, or I guess he could have, he could have revealed truth to the apostles, but then left it up to the apostles to figure out how best to communicate it using which words that ever they chose. So God could have done that. God could have, could have left it to the apostles to, without his help, to figure out how to, how to communicate these great thoughts that he's revealed. But God has gone beyond that. God hasn't just left it to the apostles and prophets to figure out how, to, how best to, to convey it. If, if he would have done that, he would have been leaving scripture to, to men who are sinful and who don't have the, the qualifications to, and, the, and the moral standing and the uh, omniscience to be able to uh, convey those thoughts to other human beings. But what God did is he not only revealed truth to the apostles, he actually, um, he actually uh, inspired the writing of those thoughts in human words so that the very words are inspired. And that's what this teaches here. This is so important because this is a huge, huge debate in the church in the modern church. So this is key. So just as back here in Matthew 5, um, Jesus says it goes down to the letter. Every letter is inspired. Here, Paul's saying every word is inspired. Um, the apostles get the revealed truth, and then, they in, and then they're inspired in the words that they use to convey that truth. Let's go to our third text, which is 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17. But as for you, and this is Paul writing to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. That's the hiera grammata. And, and in this case, this is Paul is talking about the Old Testament that Timothy grew up with, which the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Messiah Jesus. Verse 16, all scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be hartios, complete, equipped, for every good work. Okay, this is really cool. There's several key terms here that deserve uh, a definition. First is hiera, that's sacred in verse 15. That means um, something that's transcendent, something that's pure, something that's holy. So, and grammata means writing. So these are, these are holy, pure writings that um, Timothy has known from childhood. That's the Old Testament. So Paul is describing them as holy. Um, and then as we go further on, uh, graphe in verse 16, the word scripture, uh, English word scripture is the Greek word 
graphe. Graphe always in the New Testament means sacred scripture. It means the, the word of God. Every time it's used in the New Testament, that word graphe, um, its original meaning is just a writing. But every time it's used in the New Testament, it's a holy, sacred writing. Um, it occurs 51 times in the New Testament, always in reference to some part of the Bible. It refers, sometimes it refers to the whole Old Testament, sometimes to a particular Old Testament passage, sometimes to a particular New Testament passage, such as in 1 Timothy 5.18, and sometimes to a larger portion of the New Testament, as we see in 2 Peter 3.16. Um, very significantly, Paul, or sorry, Peter, in 2 Peter 3.16, refers to Paul's writings as uh, scripture, as graphe, as that same word you see in verse 16. 2 Peter 3.16, as, as Paul does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures, the other graphe. So Peter is saying that Paul's letters are graphe, they are scripture. So that is super, super important. Now, a key word here, of course, is God breathed. So your Bible may say inspired. I think that that's not a good translation. Um, the, the Greek word is Theo Neustos. Theo or is for Theos, God. And Neustos comes from the, the verb. Neustos is, um, is an ad adjective, but it comes from the verb nuo, which means to move as wind with relatively rapid motion, to blow. So it's like wind blowing. Um, John 3, 8 says, Jesus said, the wind nuos, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So that's, that's what Paul is saying here. All scripture is pushed by air, the movement of the air. It's exhaled, and not just from anywhere, it's exhaled from God. It's theo neustos. So, and notice the word all, all graphe, all scripture is exhaled by God and profitable. So that, that word or uh, the word complete there is heart artios. And that means being well fitted for some function to be complete, capable, proficient and able to meet all demands. So, so the benefit of scripture is that it profits us to be uh, proficient, to be capable as believers equipped for every good work. So here we have the extent of inspiration. All scripture is God breathed. We have the means of inspiration, which is being scripture is exhaled by God it's the exhaled breath of God. It originated not in man, but in God. And finally, we have the purpose of inspiration, which is profit to believers to equip them for all aspects of life. So this is an, a, another piece of strong evidence that the Bible teaches that the Bible itself is God-breathed, that it is inspired. And finally, our fourth and last key passage is from Peter, 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. I like the fact that we have three witnesses to the inspiration of Scripture. We have Jesus in Matthew 5, we have Paul in 1 Corinthians and 2 Timothy, and now we have Peter. So Jesus, Paul, and Peter are all saying the same thing, that all of Scripture is inspired down to the very word. So here we go, 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a damp shining lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, so this is 
this is key information. It takes priority. It's first of all, know this, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own explanation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will, or it could be the desire of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You can see why this is an important passage here. The Greek word order is really interesting in verse 21. So let me tell you the, how it sounds in the Greek in, uh, following the Greek word order. It says, but by the Spirit holy carried, spoke from God, men. <laughs> you can see that the Greek word order can be quite different from the English, but I'll say that again. But by spir Spirit Holy, or the, and we, of course, in English, we say the Holy Spirit, but by Spirit Holy, carried, spoke from God, men. So that, that I think when you say it like that, you see that the emphasis is that the Holy Spirit carried these men who therefore spoke from God. So um, a key term here is carried. What does it mean to be carried along? Well, this is the Greek word pharaoh, not pharaoh as an Egyptian pharaoh, <laughs> but just pharaoh. It's the normal normal Greek word for being carried along. It's used in Acts 27, 15. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were pharaohed, or we were driven along. So that's Paul describing the famous um, shipwreck that he was involved in as he was being taken to Rome. And in that case, the wind was very strong, and it was blowing the ship towards land, and it eventually crashed on the rocks. So that's being carried along. So that's the image we should have here, that men spoke from God as they were blown by the wind, as they were carried along by the holy breath. And remember, if we, if we combine 2 Peter 1 with 2 Timothy 3, we see that uh, God is breathing and carrying along, the Spirit is carrying along these men as they're writing. And so, as they're writing, the very words, we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 2, the very words that they're writing are inspired, are God-breathed, such that not, uh, such that every jot and tittle, every iota and dot is going to be fulfilled. And there, with those four passages, we really have the biblical doctrine of inspiration. You see in the background there, that's Paul writing one of his letters. It's a, it's a painting from, I believe, the 19th century. But imagine Paul writing a letter, one of his letters there at that desk, and he's being carried along by the Holy Spirit such that when he's putting his pen to paper, um, the, the letters he's writing, his mind is engaged, he's not mindless, he's not dictating, God's not speaking to him audibly probably, but God is moving and carrying him along to write uh, this word and not that, or to phrase it this way and not the other way. And the very th way things are phrased, the very words he uses are inspired. That's pretty amazing, and that's what makes the Bible the word of God. So let's, let's sum this up with some characteristics. First of all, the, the scripture or, or inspiration is verbal. That just means that, it, um, that inspiration applies to every letter, as we saw in Matthew 5. So scripture doesn't just contain the word of God. It is the word of God. Some, some Christian theologians take the, take the view that not all scripture is inspired, um, that some of it is ins inspired, that the Bible contains God's word, um, but it's not totally God's word. It has human error mixed in with God's word. And, and so this, we have to reject this because 
the, the, the Bible teaches and Jesus and Paul and Peter believed that every jot and tittle, every word of scripture was inspired. So it's not just the message of the Bible that's inspired, but the very words of the Bible are inspired. So both the message and the words are inspired. Again, God could have just said, all right, Paul, it's up to you. I want you to write a letter to the Ephesians and, and give them some godly advice. I'm going to tell you generally what to say, but you can, you can pick out the words you want to use in your letter. God could have done it that way, but that's not the way he's done it. He, he has inspired the very words. Plenary. Plenary means just full. So this means that um, Song of Solomon, you know, and all of the quote unquote indecent things in Saul of Solomon, the, the what Satan said to Jesus uh, in the wilderness, what Satan said to Eve um, in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Ecclesiastes, you know, written by Solomon, talking about his philosophical journey of figuring out what life is all about. Um, the Gospels, Revelation, you know, think of how different books, how, how much variety we have in the Bible, but the, 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 the doctrine of plenary inspiration says that all of those books, despite how different they are in style in form, some are poetry, some are history, some are, um, uh, you know, based off uh, dialogue, some are more like, like uh, narrative stories, but no matter how they're phrased and no matter what genre they're in, they are all equally inspired scripture. So that's, that's the view that we hold. So verbal plenary inspiration, and again, this inspiration doesn't apply to um, uh, manuscripts that come, uh, that are copied. It doesn't relate to copies, and it doesn't relate to translations, English translations or any other translations. Inspiration extends only to that first manuscript. So the, the first time or the first piece of scroll that Moses wrote, um, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, the first ever scroll that Moses wrote that on, that's what's inspired. And so the errors that, that inevitably happen when you're copying huge amounts of manuscript, you know, huge amounts of content like these scrolls did, they, were, they tried not to make mistakes in most cases, but sometimes they did. But that doesn't take away from the inspiration of the original manuscripts, which were written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. So if you look at your English Bible, it's not properly speaking correct to say that this English Bible is inspired. I think it's okay to say that, but technically um, it's only the original manuscripts that are inspired. Does, uh, does our English Bible have some um, maybe errors in it because we don't have the original. Um, it's, it's possible, but they, they, they're very small and, and not many of them. Um, and we'll talk more about this. This is a, this is a question of textual criticism, uh, which, which is another aspect of bibliology. But we can still very much trust our English Bible, um, but we just have to say that the English version is not inspired. Some and, and this is where you get in the King James only debate. Um, some people take the, the position that the King James is the, is the inspired English version of the Bible, and that's simply not the case. No English version is inspired. What's inspired or what was inspired in ages past was the first original manuscript. There are good translations and poor translations. So we can have we can have an, a debate and, and, and a dialogue over which English version is best for us today, which is most accurate to the originals. That's a good debate to have. But we, we, none of us can say that a particular English version is inspired. Okay, so where did the human authors get the data for which they wrote the inspired text. 
Well, in many cases, they got the uh, material directly from God. Um, for example, Moses would have had to get the um, material about Genesis in Genesis chapter one directly from God because there was no human eyewitness to the first uh, five days of creation. So that could only come uh, from uh, information directly from God. In Deuteronomy 9, 10, we read this, and Yahweh gave me, Moses, the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that Yahweh had spoken with you on the mountain out of the midst of the fire on the day of assembly. So in this case, this is the first tablets of stone. These are the tablets of stone that Moses broke when he saw Aaron and the Israelites um, worshiping the golden calf. The first set of tablets, God himself wrote with his own finger. So in this case, there would be no doubt that that would be, well, there's no inspiration needed because God himself wrote that. But from then on, um, what and the you know after Moses broke those tablets, the second version, uh, which was a repeat of the first, this time it was Moses who wrote it down. So in this case, it was inspired by God. And so um, material, so one source of data for for inspiration of scripture is or for scripture is material directly from God. And that's pretty obvious. But there's other ways that the human authors could get their information, could get their data. It could come from their own eyewitness experience of something that happened. And this, this happens a lot in the Gospels um, and Joshua's account of the conquest um, of Canaan that we find in Joshua. He was an eyewitness to these events. So he didn't need God to tell him what happened. They saw what happened. But when Joshua chose, made the decision to write the account of the conquest of Canaan, that's when inspiration kicked in. And the very words that Joshua used to describe the conquest, you know, Rahab and the spies, um, Achan's sin, and so forth, the very words, what Joshua chose to include in the account and what he chose to leave out, all of that was done under the inspiration of God, such that Joshua's eyewitness um, account is inspired by God. And we can say the same thing for the Gospels. Um, Matthew was an eyewitness, and John was an eyewitness. Now, Luke wasn't. Luke had to go research, and that's the next point. Sometimes the human authors got their material or got their data from research. Uh, Luke 1, 1 to 4, there Luke describes the process uh, that he took to find out the data for, for which he wrote his gospel. So Luke 1, 1 to 4, and as much as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. So there's no indication that God spoke directly to Luke. That would be the first category of data. Rather, Luke did hard work. He, he did an investigation. He interviewed witnesses. He collected material from various sources, and then he wrote his gospel and the book of Acts as well. So once he started writing, once he began uh, writing Luke chapter 1, verse 1, these words that I've just written, that is what's inspired. God, God's uh, spirit probably, I think we can say, superintended his research project uh, his gathering of materials, and once he start, once he put pen to paper, that's when that the Holy Spirit was carrying him along and inspiring every word. All Scripture, including the the Gospel of Luke, is God breathed. And then next is prophetic material. This is similar to material directly from God because most prophetic material, this is material focused on the future. Um, this 
would come directly from God as well, because no, it wasn't, there's no eyewitnesses to the future, except for God, because he's outside of time. So prophetic material is another source of data for the inspired scriptures. And we should keep in mind that one fourth of the Bible was future prophecy when it was written. So this, this is a lot of scripture and we're studying Isaiah and uh, much of that, almost all of it in, in uh, Isaiah 40 to 66 is talking about future events. Now there is other material in the Bible, some of it quite interesting. Um, and we should say that the Bible does truthfully record things that are untrue, such as the lies of Satan or the philosophical speculations of Solomon. So um, when Satan says, you sh will not surely die to Eve, uh, Satan's statement is, is, of course, false. But what's true is the, uh, the account of Satan saying that. You see what I mean? So the Bible truthfully records things that are untrue when it's said by Satan or other people who are, are saying uh, things against God. Like, uh, for example, in Sol Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2 verse 1, he says, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. So although Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived, supposedly, um, he didn't act very wise at times, especially late in life. But at this stage, he was, he was testing things out. And he said, okay, I'm just going to test pleasure and see if that can give me happiness. Well, that mindset is faithfully and truthfully recorded in scripture. Um, Solomon actually did say that to himself. Of course, we know that that way of thinking is false. It's not good to think that the key to life is pleasure, but it's accurately recorded by scripture. So, so this is um, important to keep in mind when we're talking about inspiration. The Bible does contain quotations from the writings of unbelievers, um, and it contains um, uh, information from books that, we, that have been lost to history. Um, like the book, I think the book of Enoch is mentioned in Jude. So it doesn't mean that the book of Enoch is inspired. It means that Jude's use of the book of Enoch and that quotation from the book of Enoch is inspired. So just because a biblical author uses a quote from a source doesn't mean that source in its totality is inspired. Um, but certainly the book of Jude is inspired. So biblical authors can use other material under the supervision, supervision and superintendence of the Holy Spirit. Some of the Bible does include passages that are highly emotional at times. Think of some of David's Psalms. And sometimes when we're emotional, uh, it's hard for us to write a true account or be objective. But when, when, the, when David is writing his Psalms, um, those also are inspired, and they may reflect his thinking at a specific moment in his life when he's undergoing a lot of pain and sorrow and confusion about his life, um, pressure uh, from his enemies, and, and that is faithfully recorded. That too, those poems and songs by, by David are also inspired by God. They accurately reflect Paul's thinking and are helpful to us today because we can empathize as human beings with, with the things David was going through. So pretty cool, pretty cool doctrine. Now keep, uh, keep balance bet between these three things with the inspiration of scripture. So you wanna keep these three in balance. The text of scripture is God inspired. And that's, that goes to the source, but it's man written. So it's men who wrote Genesis and Exodus and Psalms and, and, and Proverbs and Isaiah and Malachi and the Gospels and Acts and Paul's letters and Revelation. It's men who wrote that. And, and when God was inspiring the words of each of these books, he wasn't diminishing or erasing 
the the individual the individual's intelligence or individuality so scripture is god inspired but it is man written and finally it's non-erring even though it's written by men nevertheless it doesn't err now if something is man written but not god inspired then it's going to have errors in it uh, inevitably but scripture being the way it is both god inspired and man written it is non-erring god superintended the writing of scripture so that fallible authors wrote infallible words so that's pretty cool so keep those three things in balance as you're thinking about inspiration so there are some benefits i think we can ask why did god deem it necessary to uh, have a written record of his of his special revelation to human beings. Now, remember what Jacques said last week? Um, it was very good. He's, he, he basically made the point that um, not everything God has revealed is in scripture. There were things that Jesus did that we don't know about. John, John uh, the end of John, uh, uh, John chapter 21 talks about the fact that if it were to be recorded everything that Jesus did, there wouldn't be enough room in the world for all the books that could be written. So scripture is necessarily selective. Um, so not all of God's special revelation do we have access to, but what we do have access to, the scriptures themselves, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, are the written text that God wants us to have. And so we ask a qu question, why did God preserve uh, this his word in a written text? Well, there's three really good benefits of having it written down. First, there's a more accurate preservation of God's word for later generations. That makes sense. Um, if it was oral, if it was passed down orally, we might get the general gist of God's word, but we wouldn't get the exact words and um, it wouldn't be accurately preserved, and it could change theology over time if we have bad memories or if we play the game of telephone and something gets lost in translation. Secondly, the opportunity for repeated inspection of words um, permits careful study and discussion, which leads to better understanding. Hey, this is what we do in inductive Bible study. We we read and reread and read again, and we're constantly going back to the same passage over and over. I mean, how many times have you read Psalm 23 or Genesis 1 or Revelation 21 and 22? Um, it's helpful to have it written down because we can inspect it. We can look at, we can go through word by word and carefully examine it, and that leads to a better understanding of what the original author was intending to convey to the original audience. So that's a benefit. We wouldn't, it would be much harder to do that if we only had God's word orally. And finally, it's accessible to many more people um, than when preserved merely through memory or oral repetition. Many people have come to faith in Christ, not through a person, but just through having access to the Bible. And so it's that shows it's 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 great. And and that's what Wycliffe Bible translators do and other Bible translators. They try to get the word of God to as many more people. And uh, if they can print a Bible or print thousands of Bibles, the word of God can reach more people much quickly and much more uh, comprehensively and effectively than we we would uh, be able to if we had to start from Genesis to Revelation with every person we meet. We just couldn't, couldn't do that. So the preservation of God's word um, makes it accessible to many more people. So it makes sense that God has preserved the, his word in written form. Now, this is, uh, this is very, very helpful. Maybe I should have had this as my first slide, but this is kind of how scripture works for, for us as Christians. It starts with the thoughts in God's mind, and through the process of special revelation, he reveals his thoughts to prophets 
and apostles. So now it's in their mind, but there's still no written text. And so um, when it goes from the author's mind to the, uh, when pen is put to paper, when it gets on that original manuscript, that's the doctrine of inspiration. So that's what we're focused on today. Now the question arises, well, which books are inspired? Um, Paul might have written other letters that, that, uh, they that were circulating in the early church, or um, there's other gospels, like the Gospel of Thomas. Sometimes people say, well, why aren't they in the Bible? Well, the, the, the process uh, of distinguishing which uh, books are inspired is called canonicity, and that's another subject that we won't go into tonight, but that, that, you know, that requires some teaching on as well. Once you decide which books are inspired, you come to the question of, well, we don't have the originals and we have all of these copies and, and there's slight differences in them. So how do we know what the original said? Well, that's the, um, the discipline of textual criticism. And we learned a lot about this in seminary. This is the process whereby textual critics figure out what the original likely said given all the, the manuscripts that we have. And because we have so many New Testament manuscripts, it's actually, uh, we, we actually know what the original uh, said down to nine, over 99% certainty. Um, we don't have that kind of certainty with the Old Testament, but still we have great certainty that we have uh, the original, uh, that we know what the original Hebrew Old Testament said. Um, on that regard, uh, just comparing the, uh, the Isaiah manuscripts that we had before the Dead Sea Scrolls to the Dead Sea Scrolls version of Isaiah shows that the Jewish people, the Jewish scribes, were very careful in copying word for word, letter for letter, uh, the, the, um, the manuscripts of the Old Testament. So, we can have great confidence that the Bibles we have, the modern Hebrew and Greek Bibles that we have, are very, very close to the original. And then is the, there's the process of translating from the modern Hebrew and Greek Bibles into the various languages of the world for us, English or Maori. And so that's where you get your modern English version. So notice that inspiration is a different question than translation. You have to go through canonicity and textual criticism to even get to the question of translation. Then once you have the best English Bible that you can possibly have, whether it's that's the ESV or the NASB, then you're ready to go. You're ready to do your own inductive Bible study, and you do that through confession, uh, petition, uh, illumination of the Spirit, observation, interpretation. And so through, through these methods, God's thoughts get into our minds. So notice it started with thoughts in God's mind, and through this process, it's coming all the way into our minds. And then once we've interpreted it correctly, then we can discuss it with our brothers and sisters in our, in our small groups. We can preach on it. Um, we can reflect on it. We can meditate on it. We can apply it to our lives, and that results in transformation by the Holy Spirit and we see changes in our lives. And then as we're changing, as we're becoming more like Christ, our job is to communicate God's thoughts um, from his word to others in evangelism and in discipleship. So this is, this is how it's supposed to work. And we need to know about each step in the process, because if we, if we have a solid understanding and we believe in this process, we'll have We'll have great confidence in our Bibles, and we will want to communicate it to a lost world. So, how important has the Bible been, this revealed Word of God in written form, um, to the human race? Well, this quote from Benjamin B. Warfield sums it up. What does this Christian world of ours not owe to this Bible? Um, oh, hold on, I can't read the quote because this is in the way. Let me try that again. Um, what does this Christian world of ours not owe to this Bible? 
and to this Bible conceived not as a part of the world's literature, the literary product of the earliest years of the church, not as a book in which by searching we may find God and perchance somewhat of God's will, but as the very word of God, instinct with divine life from the in the beginning of Genesis to the amen of the apocalypse, breathed into by God and breathing out God to every devout reader. It is because men have so thought of it that it has proved a leaven to leaven the whole lump of the world. We do not half realize what we owe to this book. I can say amen to that, thus trusted by men. We can never fully realize it, for we can never even in thought unravel from this complex web of modern civilization all the threads from the Bible which have been woven into it throughout the whole past and now enter into its very fabric. A lot of our values, a lot of our political systems, a lot of our morality, a lot of our understanding of the world, even though we are turning away from Christianity uh, in the West, nevertheless, the Bible is so ingra ingrained in how we think. We're still Puritans. We're still, we still have the Bible out of, at our core. People that have never read the Bible still have a lot of biblical principles and biblical patterns of thought, though they don't know it. And this shows the power of scripture. So in summary, um, listen to this quote. This is from uh, our church, our last church that we attended in, in Texas. The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is the record of God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us, and therefore is and will remain to the end of the world, the true center of Christian union, and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony to Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. It is inerrant and infallible in its original manuscript, which is to be taken as verbally inspired. Great quote there. Amen. So how do we apply the, the, these, this doctrine to our lives? Well, first, of course, we ourselves should maintain a high view of scripture, and we should always speak highly of scripture. When scripture seems to be denigrated or demeaned around us, we need to sp speak up for it and say, no, scripture is God's word. And this is true within the church as well. We also should join a church that has the high view of scripture. Whatever church has the highest view of scripture in your town, that's probably going to be the church that you want to attend. We need to spend more time reading God's word than man's word. I'll admit, in the information age, it's very attractive to spend a lot of time on social media and news media and various sources of news. But when we do that, we're neglecting God's word. So why don't we spend more time reading the Bible than reading other sources of information? That would be obvious because it is God's word. Finally, we need to trust scripture more than even our own experience or opinions. We need to place ourselves under the authority of scripture because, again, scripture is sourced out of the creator of the universe, and he is omniscient and all wise. So we need to have the right priorities when it comes to what rules in our life. So we've talked about the definition, the debate over the inspiration of scripture, its importance, some four key passages, some characteristics, the verbal plenary inspiration of the original manuscripts, uh, the data from which the, the human authors got uh, their information, um, some clarifications about the doctrine, the necessity of keeping balance between God-inspired, man-written, and unerring text, um, some of the benefits of having scripture in a written form. We've talked about some implications of the inspiration of scripture and its impact in history. 
we've summarized the doctrine and um, offered some applications for our lives. So this is the inspiration of scripture. Next time, I'll talk uh, next uh, week from today, I'll talk about some defections from the inspiration of scripture that we find in the modern church. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have revealed truth to us and that uh, your prophets and apostles have written down your very words so that uh, the scripture that we, that we have in the original um, is inspired and that, that that translation process to our English Bibles ha has been well done and um, that we can trust our Bibles. Lord, help us to love your word. Um, help us to trust your word and help us to um, make your word the authority of every thought of our lives, Lord, of every issue that we face. May your word be the source that we go to because you have given instructions for us human beings to live and your word brings life to our, to, to our hearts and joy um, to our experience, Lord. So thank you for tonight. And I do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.